Hi, I'm Bruce Brown, amateur radio call sign WA9GVK, representing the Metrovision Amateur Television Club here in Alexandria, Virginia. Before beginning our presentation of highlights of amateur television's historic and continuous coverage of space shuttle mission STS-9, I'd like to give you some background into ham television. Long before commercial broadcast TV took its roots in the late 1940s, it was the amateur radio operator and the TV experimenter that were the first to actively use TV and even help in its development during the 1930s and early 40s. This ad, which appeared in magazines about 40 years ago, typifies the dominance of the amateur in the early days of TV. Back then, these video pioneers had to put their systems together, piece by piece. With transmission standards firmly established, and with major improvements in production techniques, the 1950s saw a tremendous growth and public fascination with commercial broadcast TV. Off-the-shelf and relatively low-cost TV sets were now available. You didn't have to build your own anymore. These factors, combined with the high cost of TV cameras and transmitters, led to a decline in amateur television. This situation continued until the early 1970s, when several factors led to a reemergence of ham TV. One of these factors was the availability of low-cost black and white TV cameras like this one, which was aimed primarily at the closed circuit security market. Secondly, amateurs discovered that two-way radios originally used in taxi cabs, like the one shown here, then available on the surplus market for ten dollars, could easily be modified to serve as an excellent low-cost TV transmitter. Finally, in order to improve the effectiveness of these transmitters, the amateur television repeater was developed. The repeater amplifies and retransmits the line of sight TV signals to greatly improve the range coverage from these relatively simple home transmitters. In recent years, there have been many exciting new developments. The half-inch video cassette recorder is certainly one of the most significant. With it, amateurs can provide video from remote locations, otherwise too difficult for live transmission. Tape allows us to repeat over and over again presentations of high interest. We even exchange tapes with amateurs from other countries, including Australia and Japan, to provide fascinating glimpses of life overseas. Also, hams are now able to transmit in color, thanks to the low-cost color cameras that have come about as a result of the half-inch video cassette explosion. Last but not least, thanks to the development of new solid-state devices, inexpensive and compact amateur television transmitters are now available. This one is a homebrew design, but several companies do manufacture units all put together. Now, most TV hams transmit on a frequency known as channel 13 and a half because it's located literally between channel 13 and channel 14 in the frequency spectrum. In order to receive it, you do need a special antenna, and also you need a converter box like this, which attaches to the antenna terminals on the back of the TV set. In order to transmit amateur television, you do need an FCC amateur radio license of technician class or higher. There are many excellent booklets like this one, which are available at your local electronics store, which explain the licensing procedures in much more detail. Uses for amateur TV are largely focused at the technical, scientific, educational, and public service aspects of TV itself. Uses have ranged from amateurs helping to coordinate the Rose Parade each year in Pasadena, to an amateur who uses his cameras to search the skies in Oklahoma looking for killer tornadoes. He sends his pictures over to the Weather Bureau. Of course, you can use amateur television to show off your home movies and slides, but you do run the risk of putting everybody to sleep. 
Now, the FCC does have rules and regulations which govern our on-the-air activities. For example, the transmitting of music is prohibited. Also keep in mind that amateur television is really intended for two-way interactive communications between licensed hams, rather than be engaging in one-way broadcasting like commercial stations and public stations do. Now for the space shuttle project, the FCC did waive the broadcast restrictions for us. And speaking of the space shuttle, Mission STS-9 was of particular interest to the amateur radio community since astronaut Owen Garriott, himself a ham, was going to be taking on board a small two-way ham radio to make contact with amateurs on the ground. This would be the first time anyone from space would be making direct contact with people right in the comfort of their own homes, essentially bypassing millions of dollars of the sophisticated NASA communications equipment. Throughout the world, amateurs waited in high anticipation for the space shuttle to pass overhead in an attempt to hear and contact the astronaut directly. With NASA authorization, amateur television was able to plug into the space agency's own communication system to obtain live video from right inside the shuttle. Thanks to the NASA and FCC approvals, amateur TV was permitted to serve a truly unique role that is provide a view of the American space program rarely seen by the public and do so to a depth and degree far exceeding that provided by commercial or public broadcasting stations. You might say with this project, amateur TV truly found a niche in the world of video communications.